I ain't gonna hold you. So tonight we are looking at chapters one and two from Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. So we jump right into it. The uh, title of chapter one is, If You Want to Gather Honey, Don't Kick Over the Beehive. So it tells the story about John Wanamaker. John Wanamaker found out the stories that bears his names once confessed. I learned 30 years ago that it is foolish to scold. I have enough trouble overcoming my own limitations without fretting over the fact that God has not seen fit to distribute evenly the gift of intelligence. Want to make a learn this lesson early, but I personally had to blunder through this old world for a third of a century before it even began to dawn upon me that 99 times out of 100, people don't criticize themselves for anything, no matter how wrong it might be. Criticism is futile because it puts a person on the defensive and usually makes him strive to justify himself. Criticism is dangerous but it wounds a person's precious pride, hurts his sense of importance, and arouses resentment. He also picks up and says, George B. Johnson of Eden, Oklahoma, is the safety coordinator for an engineering company. One of his responsibilities is to see that employees wear their hard hats wherever they are on the job in the field. He reported that whenever he came across workers who were not wearing hard hats, he would tell them, with a lot of authority of the regulation and that they must comply. As a result, he would get a sullen acceptance and an offer he had left the workers would remove their hats again like he had found them. He decided to do a different approach. The next time he found some of the workers not wearing their hard hat, he asked if the hats were uncomfortable or did not fit properly. Then he reminded the men in a pleasant tone of voice that, he, that the hats was designed to protect them from injury and suggested that it always be worn on the job. The result was increased compliance with the regulation with no resistance or emotional upset. He talked a little bit about um, even if people are wrong, like he, he picked out a couple criminals as well. He says that even if people are wrong, they aren't ready to admit it or they don't see themselves as being wrong. So when you accuse them of being wrong, they get defensive. So he uses the adage that you have to come at it from another perspective if you hope to even have a dialogue. He says, as Lincoln lay dying, Secretary of War Stanton said, there lies the most perfect ruler of men that the world has ever seen. Even after Lincoln had become a practicing lawyer in Springfield, Illinois, he attacked his, components, his opponents openly in letters published in the newspapers. But he did this just one time too often. In the autumn of 1842, he ridiculed a vain, pugnacious politician by the name of James Shields. Lincoln lampooned an anonymous letter published in the Springfield Journal. The town roared with laughter. Shield, Shields, sensitive and proud, boiled with indignation. He found out who wrote the letter, leaped on a horse, started after Lincoln and challenged him to fight to a duel. Lincoln didn't want to fight. He was opposed to dueling but he couldn't get out of it and had to save his honor. He was given the choice of weapons. Since he had very long arms, he chose cavalry broadswords and took lessons in sword fighting from a West Point graduate. On the appointed day, he and Shields met on a sandbar in Missis on the Mississippi River, prepared to fight to death, but at the last minute, their seconds interrupted and stopped the duel. That was the most lurid personal incident in Lincoln's life. It taught him an invaluable lesson in the art of dealing with people. Never again did he write an insulting letter. Never again did he ridicule anyone. And from that time on, he almost never criticized anybody for anything. So Lincoln was cold with his pen, but he noticed that he really offended some people. And then he just decided that it wasn't worth the price to offend somebody just to be able to tell them off, especially when your life could be on the line. He says, do you know someone... You would like to change and regulate and improve? Good, that is fine. I am all in favor of it, but why not begin on yourself? From a purely selfish standpoint, that is a lot more profitable than trying to improve others. Yes, and a lot less dangerous. Don't complain about the snow on your neighbor's roof, said Confucius, when your doorstep is unclean. He goes on to say, Bitter criticism called the sensitive Thomas Hardy one of the finest novelists ever to enrich English literature, to give up forever the writing of fiction. Criticism drove Thomas Chatterton, the English poet, to suicide. 
Benjamin Franklin tactics in his youth became so diplomatic, so adroit, adroit at handling people that he was made an American ambassador to France. The secret of his success, he says, I will never speak ill of no man, he said, and speak all the good I know of everybody. So it goes back to the title of the chapter that you definitely attract more bees with honey. Uh, so we go on to chapter two. Chapter two is the big secret of dealing with people. It says Sigmund Freud said that everything you and I do springs from two motives, the sex urge and the desire to be great. John Dewey, one of America's most profound philosophers, phrased it a bit differently. Dr. Dewey said that the deepest urge in human nature is the desire to be important. Remember that phrase, the desire to be important. It is significant. You're going to hear a lot about that in this book. So just a different schools of thought, but the same basic premise. It says, if you tell me how you get your feeling of importance, I'll tell you what you are. That determines your character. That is the most significant thing about you. For example, John D. Rockefeller got his feeling of importance by giving money to erect a modern hospital in Peking, China to care for millions of poor people whom he had never seen or never would see. Dillinger, on the other hand, got this feeling of importance by being a bandit, a bank robber, and a killer. The writer Mary, Reb Mary Roberts Reinhardt once told me of a bright, vigorous young woman who became an invalid in order to get a feeling of importance. One day, said Miss Reinhardt, this woman had been obliged to face something her age, perhaps. The lonely years were stretching ahead and there was little left for her to anticipate. She took to her bed and for 10 years, her mother traveled to the third floor and back, carrying trays and nursing her. Then one day, the old mother, weary with service, lay down and died. For some weeks, the invalid languished. Then she got up, put on her clothes and resumed living again. <laughs> so kind of a funny story, but it just goes to show sometimes that you go out of your way to help people who could really help themselves, but they won't help themselves until they have to. But that's a, that's a really interesting story. But that's what the girl did for attention as well. It says one of the first people in American business to build a salary over a million dollars a year when there was no income tax and a person earning $50 a week was considered well off was Charles Schwab. He had been picked by Andrew Carnegie to become the first president of the newly formed United States Steel Company in 1921. When Schwab was only 38 years old, Schwab left U.S. Steel to take over the then troubled Bethlehem Steel Company, and he rebuilt it into one of the most profitable companies in America. Why did Andrew Carnegie pay a million dollars a year or more than $3,000 a day to Charles Schwab? Why? Because Schwab was a genius. No, because he knew more about the manufacture of steel than other people. Nonsense. Charles Schwab told me himself that he had many men working for him who knew more about the manufacture of steel than he did. Schwab said that he was paid this salary largely because of his ability to deal with people. I asked him how he did it. Here is his secret, set down in his own words. Words that ought to be cast in eternal bronze and hung in every home and school, every shop and office in the land. Words that children ought to memorize instead of wasting their time memorizing the conjugation of Latin verbs, or the amount of annual rainfall in Brazil, words that will all but transform your life and mine if we will only live by them. He says, I consider my ability to arouse enthusiasm among my people, said Schwab, the greatest asset I possess and the way to develop the best that is in a person by appreciation and encouragement. There is nothing else that so kills the ambition of a person as criticism from superiors. I never criticize anyone. I believe in giving a person incentive to work, so I am anxious to praise but loath to find fault. If I like anything, I am hearty in my approbation and lavish in my praise. So he definitely uh, talks about making sure that you leave a good, positive impression and that you focus on the good from others. It says even Queen Victoria was susceptible to flattery. Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli confessed that he put it on thick in dealing with the Queen. To use his exact words, he said he spread it on with a trowel. But Disraeli was one of the most polished, deft, and adroit men who ever ruled the far-flung British Empire. He was a genius in his line. What would work for him wouldn't necessarily work for you and me. In the long run, flattery will do more harm than good. 
Flattery is counterfeit, and like counterfeit money, it will eventually get you into trouble if you pass it to someone else. The difference between appreciating flatter, appreciation and flattery, that is simple. One is sincere, the other one is insincere. One comes from the heart out, the other from the teeth out. One is unselfish, the other is selfish. One is universally admired, the other universally condemned. He goes on to say, the next time you enjoy filet mignon at the club, send word to the chef that it was excellently prepared. And when a tired salesperson shows you unusual courtesy, please mention it. He goes on to say, Emerson said, every man I meet is my superior in some way and that I learn of him. If that was true of Emerson, it is likely to be a thousand times more true for you and me. Let's cease thinking of our accomplishments and wants. Let's try to figure out the other person's good points. Then forget flattery. Give honest, sincere appreciation. Be hearty in your approbation and lavish in your praise. And people will cherish your words and treasure them and repeat them over a lifetime. Repeat them years after you have been forgotten or after you have forgotten them. Thanks for listening to the readings. We're going to keep pushing with the next chapters.